Hi, today I'm going to be talking about the Palm 3. I'm a huge fan of Palm and I've collected a number over the years. And if you've ever watched my channel before, or I've ever bought you a gift, you know it can be pretty thrifty. Case in point, this Palm I picked up for 50p. So it's not working at the moment, so I'm going to see if I can take it apart, see if I can fix it, and hopefully show it working. If not, you'll see a grown man wash a PDA. So let's go. So here it is, the Palm 3. Unsurprisingly, the third generation of Palm devices, and the first one to drop the Pilot moniker, despite that's what most people called them for years to come. It first went on sale in 1998, sporting its improvements over the previous model, including a sleeker design, having these bottom edges slightly tapered, and a protective front flap, which is actually quite useful protecting the screen. It was also the first to have integrated infrared for transmitting small amounts of data. And talking of data, it had a whopping 2 megabytes of EDO SD RAM for storing user data, and another 2 megabytes of flash ROM for the iOS. The memory is actually on a separate board, so it was possible to upgrade, although I've never actually seen an official one. I have come across people modifying these boards though, by either stacking the chips or replacing them, pushing it up to an incredible 8 megabytes. Being a pretty tricky job, I'm not really sure the risk versus the reward really pays off these days. The screen was essentially the same 2-bit grayscale resistive touchscreen as the previous models, the Palm Pilot Personal and the Palm Pilot Professional. A nice feature of the screen is it does have an electroluminescent backlight, so it could be used in the dark. It's running on a 16MHz Motorola Dragon Ball, which is in the 68000 series processor. The 68000 series was also used in a number of earlier Macs. The Palm 3 was also rebadged as an IBM workpad, and all in all was a pretty capable device. So let's see if I can get it working. I'll start by trying some batteries and see what I get. So there's a the standard battery corrosion here. And not much happening. Hopefully it's just a bad contact due to corrosion. But I'm going to open it up, look inside, and see if I can spot any other issues. So there are four Phillips screws on the back, and once they're all out, then there's just some clips around the edges. It's looking surprisingly clean inside, it's nice to see there's no sign of water damage. So this is the room cave for the screen. So if I remove that, hopefully I can get the board out. Before I take the board out, here's the memory. It just clips out like a standard RAM module. So the main board was clipped in around the edges, and the battery compartment goes through the middle, so it was a bit of a tight fit, but it should just come out. And there it is, the Dragon Ball running the whole thing. Not that one. The button pads are just carbon contacts and they look pretty clean. So taking the whole screen out, it looks in pretty good shape. Obviously the flap on the front's doing its job. And now with it all apart, I can give the whole thing a good clean.
and you may come to expect from this channel, I'm going to use some IPA to lean the board. So whilst I've been the board, I noticed the backup capacitor was a little wobbly, and actually one of the solder joints wasn't attached. Then I noticed the capacitor was in a bit of a sorry state, and maybe the culprit of why it's not working. So I'm just going to remove it. So as you can see there's a massive hole in the side, I'm guessing that gave a loud pop when it went. So now with that out I'm just going to order a replacement. So that literally took over 5 months to arrive. And I've also ordered some from somewhere else, which have also not arrived. But now I've actually got it, I can see about trying to get it working. I'm just cleaning out the battery corrosion with a bit of vinegar. If you want to know more about battery leaks, I've got another video on it, so check out the link in the description. And now I'll just solder it in. I had to trim the legs a little because they're a bit longer, but other than that, it was just a drop in replacement. Luckily, it's quite easy to replace it because the pads are quite big. Clean the joints and reassemble. Now, moment of truth. Put some batteries in and test. And look at that, straight on. Yes. And the touchscreen's even working. So now I've set it all up, let's look at what an off the shelf Palm 3 has to offer. It's running on version 3.0 and comes with a pretty basic set of apps. Here's a simple calculator app. Can't really say I'm a fan of the round buttons. Like other palms of this era, the screen itself takes up the top three quarters, while the bottom quarter is home to these shortcuts. Application takes you back to the applications list. Calculator, unsurprisingly opens the calculator again. Find is just a search across the whole device, and can help you find addresses, memos, to-do items in a hurry, a menu opens the top context menu for whatever application you're in. The large rectangle in the centre is the graffiti section, the feature of which was one of the main driving forces behind Palm's success at the time. It allowed for relatively quick input for a device of this size, and I always found it pretty intuitive. Although this is still using the first version, which relies on single keystrokes per letter, and I definitely had more experience using graffiti too. A few crib sheets were also packaged with the devices, and the Palm 3 even had space for a sticker on the screen flap. So going through the rest, there's also preferences for saying things like date and time. Memo pad for taking notes. You can even categorize them or make them private. Being private means they can be hidden by an OS wide setting. If you've got any rude messages you don't want people seeing. As you can see, they're all very much business focused with mail, addresses, and date book. I can only assume the word calendar was trademarked and these would all be updated and synced from your desktop from the moment you popped out of the office. And unfortunately, there isn't a single game on here. 
You may have seen there's a few physical buttons on the bottom too. These are also shortcuts to different applications. You can even configure what applications they go to, although given the fact they're all got icons it might be a bit confusing. And the centre ones are just for up and down scrolling in applications. But the best part about the buttons is they could be used for games, meaning playing a quick game of Tetris or Breakout was a lot more enjoyable. The green button's for power and turns on and off, and it also has the trick of turning on the backlight if you hold it for 3 seconds. And in low light levels, it looks pretty good. Flipping it over you can see the contrast wheel, and the battery compartment, which takes a pair of AAAs, and the data port's hidden under this sprung door. The stylus just slides out the top, and the best feature of it is you can unscrew it like a ninja-esque sword cane to reveal this small pin, and it's specifically designed to hit the reset button on the back. I just think it's great attention to detail to allow you to be able to reset it on the go, a bit like having a cyanide capsule in your tooth. So I guess I'll have to find another use for my bent paper clips. I'm hoping to sort out a serial cable soon so I can connect it up and install a few more apps. I'm also hoping to upgrade the operating system. As of version 3.3, not only can I do infrared hot sinks, it also comes with a new currency called the Euro. So I'm excited to get hold of that. Well, I'm over the moon to have it all working, and there's another palm I can add to my collection. If you've liked anything in the video or you found it interesting, please hit the like button, it really helps out. And if you want to see more, hit the subscribe. Thanks for watching.